mission. We have ended on the Russian turn seven. All right, so let's get rid of this. Let's get rid of this. Get rid of that. Um, so first things first, we got to go through our steps now. Let's look at the rules for the campaign. Refit phase. Um, if you've never done this, uh, you pay attention to this. All right, so refit phase. Now, this is what we're looking at here. So we have to do all these things uh, in order. So we have no melee. Uh, we can start removing markers. So this FFE can go. Uh, what markers we remove? FFE, SR, and barrage markers. So let's get all these out of the way. Um, any smoke? None. Acquired target markers. All right, and then uh, let's get rid of the pins. Radios and field phones. So uh, we have none. We only have our offboard observer. We can get rid of him. And any DM disrupted. So let's get rid of the DMs. Or is anybody disrupted? I do not believe so. Berserk wall advantage. So we have no wall advantage markers. They're all gone. CX motions, crew exposed, and buttoned up status. Everybody is buttoned up. Uh, there's no turret. You guys are gone because your attachments. Uh, hidden units are placed on board. Sewer markers, yep, snipers come off. German air support counters come off as well. All right, so now we determine the scenario of victory. Again, because we're playing leaflet house rules, uh, there is no scenario winner, although we do have enough to determine that we do win because we have uh, stone locations. We have one, two, three, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So we have 15 locations. So if we were not playing Leafed House Rules, we would have won anyways. Um, rally. So now everything is unbroken. And we only care about the Germans. We don't care about the Russians because the, all the Russians are going to be going bye-bye. All right. I believe that is it for broken Germans. All right. Next up, we have um, encirclement. Do we have any encircled? No. Minefields. We only have the one here. So we don't have to worry about any kind of attack. Perimeter determination. All right, so now we determine our front line. So we start using these um, these markers here. So let's start with the axis. So we have one here, which we will point back to the um, to the uh, axis location here. And then we have another one in this location. And then we have another one in this location. And you can see how we're just pointing to the previous one. Uh, let's put them in this location here. 
right? So ding, ding. And then we have G6. That is K6. So we can come to here, put that down, and then we're going to come all the way over to here, put that down. And then we go one, two, three, four, five. Nope, not there. So we would have to come to uh, this location here. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. So we could uh, come through that location there. down the hex spine, it would just alternate. So this would come like a pocket. I think. Um, it's got to be ground level as well. Now nobody's at ground level, they're inside the cellar. Now we have to come up to this way. Up, up, up. Uh, is it ground unit? Yeah, friendly unit. So this one here will actually be over here facing that way, which means we can then put one up over here. And then we have over here. And then we have this one here. Now, we will not be able to control this hex because it would be a pocket. So the perimeter would actually come like this. Now, the concept is, again, if you've never played campaigns, it's right down here. Um, you must contain every friendly unit and may contain some enemy. Uh, if the loop is determined properly, each side will be able to start at any frontline location, and by moving only into adjacent frontline locations, may never re-enter the same frontline location. So what that means is, in the case like this, I go to V1, I'd have to come into W1, and then I would backtrack, so I'm not allowed to claim this. This is going to be a pocket. And the rest of the uh, counters, so we go one, one, one over to here, down to here, up to here, down to here, all the way over to here. Then we come across like that. Now we can do the same with the Russians. So uh, we'll first start off there. Now because they own these locations, I'm not going to put a marker there. I'm just going to use the, uh, the arrow marker. If I don't have a German marker on it, then I'll have to use that. All right, so then you come up to here. And then you're here. Yeah, see, this would be a pocket. Because again, you, you can't, you need positive control, which means you need to have a unit here. And because they those guys broke, they run away that uh, they were not able to bring it in. So this here, will look like this. We'll come down to there. Now you will come this way here to this way and then down the road to this location and then finally to this location. All right, so that's what our perimeters look like. Now I'm going to draw that in with the uh, the lines. So I'll do that off screen. But again, we're going to have a pocket here, and we're going to have a pocket over here. Now let's look at how we resolve those. So yeah, so we have sections outside both perimeter areas with no man's land. So 
strategic location can never be a no man's land. It must be controlled by somebody. So in this case, this here no man's land is going to be controlled by the Russians. Again, um, what do they call it there? Strategic locations, uh, if you're unaware, are basically all rubble, wood, uh, buildings, stone buildings, stone rubble, not debris, but um, yeah, each building and location, with exception of sewers and rooftops, rubble, pillbox, entrenchments, Map edge hexes and shore hexes are all strategic locations. So that's why I've been putting down these German ones into this uh, buildings and rubble because it all counts. Uh, all right, so now we can start removing the Russian units. Now all these suspects are just, I'm just going to delete because they're going to be replaced when I reset up for the next mission. Now, they still count as a squad purpose for uh, uh, setting up uh, perimeters, but uh, that's all. So uh, I can get rid of these guys here as well. Now, um, let's go back to our order that we're doing things in. So right now we've just resolved no man's land. Again, we have a German pocket here which will belong to the Germans. This one here will belong to the Russians. So we'll put a Soviet one on that one. All right, now we use the map edge markers to delineate our map. So again, we are set. This is the German edge. So I can bring on friendly units anywhere from V0 to uh, A10. All right, so what I've done is I basically combined the uh, perimeter determination with the map edge markers and the perimeter markers. This is where you place your closing loops at ground level to determine where the perimeter itself is. All right, so uh, if we look ahead to 11.6058 in the process of expanding a pocket, a friendly map edge adjacent to this. So this location here would be added to the perimeter. So we can move it to that location. Now, uh, that's it for that. Non-ground level pockets can also form a pocket if they're present in a location and reach a ground level, except the enemy controlled location. So because our Perimeter K1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, this is going to be a pocket in the cellar. So that means these units will stay. Um, actually, no, they don't have to. They could leave. So I think we're going to get rid of this. And um, change it. That would be access now. Yeah, because this is a cellar location, these units here could leave um, outside this location here. All right, so next we have isolated areas, of which we have none. And this is one reason why I was um, moving around the way I was. I was trying to avoid having isolated units. So things like armor that might be lying outside of a pocket and suddenly you're missing your armor, that kind of thing. So... Oh yeah, these guys should be unbroken now. All right, so isolation's not applicable. Next is drawing the perimeter. So this is what we're gonna do. We'll bring out our overlays. And 
and we'll start drawing lines. So I'm just going to speed through this part here, but uh, I think you get the idea. And that's what we'll continue on all the way down till we have our perimeter delineated. Um, next up, so we've just drawn it. Again, there's a quite uh, verbose description of how you do your perimeter. So I recommend you read that if you've never done it. Again, this gets replicated on your enlargements. Um, uh, the handouts. If you laminate them, you can uh, draw on them with the Stadler and it makes it much easier for uh, purposes. All right, now we can clear the map. Uh, I think we can get rid of all the pins. We don't need those anymore. Well, they would have come off at the end of the turn anyways. So uh, all the pins are gone. DMs are gone. Now we can start sorting out our units. Now we don't have any reinforcements. So all of our units are um, are going to be staying. All right, that's it for the Germans. Now we can delete all of the Russians. Remember, oh, fortified locations will stay on, but all the units themselves will come off. All right, now you're within the perimeter area, so you'll be gone as well. You are... Uh, you guys are gone. I don't need you. I might keep the mortar. Um, let's finish drawing the perimeter line. All right, so that is the Russian, or excuse me, the German line. Now I'm only going to throw in where the um, Russian ones deviate. Uh, all right, so this way we go up, down, up, down. So yeah, I tend to give the Russians the benefit of the doubt when it comes to perimeter line. Just it seems uh, seems better that way, more fitting. All right, so um, we can put you guys here on the map edge. We can get rid of all of these. All right. Oh yes, we must not forget our tank that has all its broken MGs. All right, so... We do have some ordnance on the board. Now let's go back to our... Perimeter is now drawn, so now we remove all non-isolated equipment. The mobile vehicles are left on map, so we do have the one Russian uh, T-70. Retained equipment, all stuff inside. So this, this, and this are all within my perimeter, so they belong to me. I'll probably be losing them, but you never know. Might be able to hold on to some. Uh, all right, so next up. Now, I could just destroy them. Again, I'd have to use capture to use weapons. It may come in handy. Uh, hidden fortifications are NA with solitaire, effectively. Uh, no, none of this applies. No fires were, were uh, spread. Wounded leaders. Do we have any wounded leaders?
we do not have any wounded leaders, so that's good. Uh, what's next? Now we do battle hardening and promotion. So all half squads must be uh, recombined as best possible. You're only allowed to have one of each half squad type. Um, uh all right so uh yeah i did leave two mortars off and a russian captured heavy okay i think we're set to start distributing now we have you so you're going to be a full squad you'll be gone that gives me one of each half squad so i do meet that requirement um, now, again, the leaflet house rules, we do not do this bit in yellow. So I can eliminate this hero and battle harden one squad. All right, so you're gone, and we're going to battle harden. Oh, uh, you. So battle harden the one squad. Now again, in a normal game, this is where CVP comes into play. So if you want to look at that casualty bin, we have 71 for the Axis, 35 for the um, Russian. And therefore, we would have uh, a minus 4. Fractions around the down, a minus four to our roll to see how many squads were, uh, and we want to, so that should be a total of minus seven, which means we would be having five squads battle harding. But because the house rules, you ignore that. Uh, these part of the rules, we're not going to. Now, the same with the leader. So we have no heroic leaders. Um, again, because leaflet house rules, we should not be able to uh, battle harden anybody. Uh, where is it? Leaders. Yeah, so, uh, 1103. <clears throat> or, uh, yeah, 11.6113. Delete line three each side. So we ignore this part here. All right, so we ignore that part, and therefore we undo the top part. So um, no here, uh, no leaders will be battle hardened. All right, next up we have uh, promotion out of the ranks. Again, I could if I wanted to, but I do have enough leaders. I don't really care about that. Now we're into a new day. Now, again, leaflet house rules uh, prevents night attacks. And therefore, we're just going to be into a new campaign game day. So we have to do these ref, uh, refit steps. Booby trap is never going to be adjusted sniper. So each side of sand is currently greater than or equal to four. Uh, so it only applies to the Russian. Greater than or equal to four is reduced if I roll a five or higher. All right, so it, there you stay at uh, five um, for the next day. Oh, wait. Must make a die roll with a die roll equal to that side's current sand minus four. So it would be Each side whose sniper activation number is currently four or greater must make a die roll with a plus die roll equal to that side's current sand minus four. So there would be a plus one to that because you're one greater than five. Yeah, okay, all right, all right. So booby traps are always going to be level C, never changed. Uh, each abandoned on isolated may 
be remanned and operated. Now, a mobilization removal. So this is going to come into play for the one Russian tank here because it's immobilized, courtesy of my OBA. So we do a removal die roll. So roll the one, which means it's gone. All right, so that was easy. <clears throat> Next up. Weapon repair. So I do have some mouth weapons, especially on my tank. Now, we do have one here. Now, let's look at the leaflet house rules. See what it says about repair attempts on weapons. All malfunction vehicular armaments can possibly be repaired while all non-vehicular weapons are eliminated. So that means I lose this, which sucks. I'm already down weapons and I've uh, just lost another one. Um, hmm. Okay, well, next up, we have to repair our weapons on the vehicle. Now we need a two or less, minus two for being vehicular mounted. Uh, on a three or more, it's gone. So uh, I need a modified uh, four or less, four or less to repair the BMG and the CMG. All right, so the CMG is X'd, and this is fine. Actually, I'll keep on the, uh, the CMG. All right, so the CMG is mouth for good. Now, I believe I get to destroy the Russian equipment, but I don't think I get victory points for that. Each capture weapon is eliminated. 6135. Now, if we have not passed that yet, then I would get victory points for that. Uh, we said... Um, capture weapons. 11.6135. 11 11 All right, so you're after... So I don't get a count you. So I get to eliminate all this. Not that I want those anyways. And the Russian 50 as well. Or a heavy weapon. All right. Now we have to look at weapon repair is all done. AFV MG exchange. So I could eliminate one of you to bring back this coax. Which I think is a fair amount. It's an LMG for five firepower. I think that's a fair trade. So capture weapons are automatically eliminated. We don't have to worry about ammo removal, armor withdrawal. All right, so now each mobile non-isolated AFV is eliminated, not possible. Uh, AFE platoon withdrawal. So now we see if or we lose our armor. Now friendly side win loss is one to two. It's NA until these two snares are, are done. So we just roll one die and a five or less, we retain our, our uh, panzers. Now, I could attempt to remove this minefield, 
However, I don't have any engineers yet. Yeah, I don't have any assault engineers. So I would have to roll a single die and it would be a three or less. If I roll a six, a non-isolated elite MMC will be casualty reduced. So I have 50-50 chance of reducing this. And if I don't, then I will um, possibly, worst case, I will be reduced one of my squads. So I'm not going to attempt to remove that. Next up, we do CPP replenishment. Now again, leaf of house rolls. Both sides roll a die and both sides use the best roll. So I'm going to roll twice and we'll take the, the lowest one. So that's for six and four. So we have a four modified by our historical modifier for the second day is a minus two. So that's going to be a two and I suffered 20 CVP uh, rounded down. So I actually get a further minus two and a plus one. So all total, there's a minus four with a plus one. So minus three onto that four will give us a one. So we do have 18 CPP to use. Uh, 18 CPP, eh? All righty then. So, replenishment is 18, which gives us 18 points to spend. We've used up all of our um, purchase points for the first day, so I'm not sure what to buy yet. I'm thinking with 18, I could bring on an engineer squad, but there's also the opportunity to bring in several more infantry squads. Uh, let's look at the rest of the refit phase. So we have, uh, that's done. ELR lost gain. Each side makes a die roll determine if it's ELR changes. Final die roll less than or equal to two. Actually, uh, according to the Leafler house rules, it always stays the same modified inversely by a positive historical die roll modifier uh, right here. Yeah, the ELR can be decreased by the positive historical die roll modifier. So for the Germans, um, in 29 October and 30 will be at a three ELR, not four and so forth. So we're going to be at 4 ELR up until the uh, 29th. All right, next up is reinforcement groups purchase. Again, I'm really not sure what to buy. I do have 18. So I was thinking of getting um, a pioneer company would give me eight A38s and I would have four points left over. So I could... I could maybe get a rocket with a uh, offboard observer and a pre-registered hex so would be a total of four. Then I can drop a nubblewer for somewhere in this area. Or I could trade up for a, uh, a pack 40. Or I could do two rifle companies. And a pack 40. Do I need pack 40s? Maybe I should get a Stug platoon. And then, of course, there's also Stuka. So if I spend two points on Stukas, I'll be able to get uh, three or four, depending on how much I spend. Now, if I want heavies, I can always spend six points on a heavy weapon platoon. So that would be six. A rifle company would bring it up to 13, would give me five points left to spend. I could get a Stug 33B. Wait, they're only available uh, 8 November? 
the 33 Bs are available 5th November, so I have to wait. I can't get the Stug 3. I could get the 3G. Assault gun with a 75. A rifle company. And a heavy weapon platoon. Would be uh, probably reasonable. I don't think I'm going to worry about OBA. I was underwhelmed at how stupid this whole 80 millimeter mortar was. Um, I mean, there is a benefit to having a rocket randomized somewhere on this location. If I get a pre-registered hex, it would maximum deviation would be three. So I could drop a 150 on this factory, for example, and then assault in. I'll have to think about that. Uh, what else can I do for you guys here? Um, I guess that's it. Initiative attack determination. All right, so this is where we look at our solitaire rules. Let me bring those up. All right, so um, let's look at our modifiers for the enemy force. Now, initiative determination is what's done after the friendly side makes their choice. You roll in this chart to see whether or not the Russians counterattack. So they have a minus one for historical, I believe. It's minus one. Yes, so they have a minus one um, per day since the last enemy attack chip would be minus two. Friendly side one would be minus three. And for each 60 VP suffered by the enemy is a plus. So they suffered, uh, what did we say it was? Um, 71, so that would be a plus two. So right now we have a minus two, uh, minus three with a plus two would be a minus one. The minus one chance of them being an attack. Now I'm actually considering going idle just to uh, recoup. And I do have to take an idle day at some point in the first five day block. Again, according to the leaflet house rules, uh, idle requirement. So between 17 October and 22nd, I have to take at least one rest day. Now, if I roll, if I decide on idle and he attacks, I'm in the defensive. And whatever I buy will have to come on. If I idle and he rolls idle, then I'll be able to set up my units on board, do another replenishment for an eventual assault. Um, I don't know. If I roll a two or less, he's on the attack, and then I'm on the defensive. Now, uh, what does an attack in solitaire look like, if you're curious? Um, we go up to here. Uh, attack an enemy. So we set up our scenario as per this. And then we roll a die randomly to see what it is. Either it's a probing attack, general, or an all-out attack. Now, when we set up our suspects in a subsequent... Um, for the next mission, we would set up, I believe, if it's an attack chip within three hexes. All right, yeah, so here it is. It's, this is the section right here. I was here already. Um, uh, two or more hexes away from every frontline location if they select an attack chip. Now, one of my issues with Solitaire and these kind of campaigns is that that's not going to generate a lot of units. There's going to be suspects and two hexes away 
depending on what I then roll, will determine whether or not it's an all-out general or probing attack, which basically means uh, at the end of the day, I'm only going to have two rows of suspects to deal with. There will not be any reserve. So you would have the frontline location according to 41A, and every uh, hex that's within two of that location. So uh, this was brought up before on Game Squad forums. Does that mean you have C12 as the frontline location and you have 13 and 14? Or is this inclusive? One, two. Less than or equal to two hexes from an enemy and frontline location. So I might have a row of three suspect counters. Now, um, I do have a lot of positions that I should be able to fend off an attack from them. It's going to be a daytime counterattack if they attack anyways. I'm just wondering, do I go idle or not? I think I'm going to go idle. I suffered a lot of casualties. Um, <laughs> a lot of casualties. Uh, that's two, ten, uh, five, seven, eight, nine, um, ten, eleven. Yeah, I don't know. What do you guys think? Uh, I think I'll leave that out after this video. I'll um, I'll leave it in the comments for you guys to let me know. What do you think? Should I go idle? Or should I attack? This is what I have left to go attacking with. Any reinforcements, barring the heavy weapon platoon, will have to enter from off forward. So I'm thinking of a rifle company, a heavy weapon platoon. And then that would save me five points. I could either buy another armor unit, like a Stug G's, or I could just hold on to it for the next turn. So... Uh, I'm going to end the video here. It's gone on way too long already. And um, yeah, let me know what you guys think. We're looking to hear. So this Fnatic unit will actually be uh, no longer Fnatic. He cannot, um, whoop. he cannot battle harden any further. Yeah, all right. Uh, let me know what you guys think. Thank you very much for watching this video, and uh, we'll see you guys in the next video. Bye-bye.